So this is a planarian worm, and this is a planarian worm being cut in half. But don't worry, it's still alive, and it actually does this to itself all the time. And that's because planarian worms have the ability to regenerate another head from the remaining tail. The head also grows a tail, and this is how they reproduce. But how did we take this information and create two-headed worms, and these worms with three limbs? And how does that relate to the growth of a tadpole, and why we can create tadpoles with eyes on their tails? And how does learning to control the growth of tadpoles relate to creating synthetic organisms, and what can we do with these synthetic organisms? And lastly, how are the planarian worm and this frog so similar that we were able to regrow its limb using principles learned from this without any genetic engineering. And in the future, will we be able to regenerate the limb of a mouse or even a human? Let's take a look. Now is the time to take risk. First off, all animals from axolotls to humans have millions of cells with cell membranes. There are many types of ion channels, but the main purpose is to move charged ions across the cell membrane. And since these are charged ions, this means that there is constantly a voltage potential between the outside and the inside of the cell. This is most commonly studied with action potentials at axons in the brain because, of course, neuroscience is the study of electricity in the brain. But this bioelectricity with these voltage potentials isn't just limited to the brain, it's happening in every cell of every animal due to these ion channels. And the ions moving in and out of the ion channels end up polarizing the entire cell. And all of these polarized cells interacting together end up creating polarity on a larger scale such as polarizing the heads and tails of a planarian worm. Before I discuss the rest of this image, I want to say that there is external bioelectricity. For example, when you get a wound, there is a current across that wound and you can increase the healing rate by increasing the current. It's slightly related to this and I think it's really awesome, so it's going to be the topic of my next video. Be sure to subscribe for that. Okay, back to this polarized worm. This polarization is what signals to grow either a head or a tail after it's cut in half. A good visualization is if you cut a magnet in half. See how when it's cut, it divides into a north and south pole, and then when it regrows, it regrows the missing pole. And you can see this because when it's cut, certain enzymes appear that belong in the head or the tail. But this isn't limited to just cutting the worms in half. If you cut a chunk out of the middle of the worm, you'll see that each side of the chunk has different voltage potentials. And these different voltage potentials signal to turn on different processes to grow either a head or a tail. And now this is where it gets really cool. If you take this same chunk and add an antibiotic named nigericin, the voltage on the right side will become the same as on the left side. And this means that the processes to stimulate the growth of a head occur on both sides of the wound. And so now we've created a two-headed worm. And if you want, you can slightly alter the process so that each time you cut the worm, it regrows with two heads over and over. And we aren't limited to creating just two-headed worms. We can change the voltage potential at any point on the worm and create triple-headed worms or even quadruple-headed worms. And that's how we ended up with this two-headed, one-tailed worm. And we're not just limited to flat worms. We can create spiky worms or cup-shaped worms just by altering the electric circuits. And when I say we, I mostly mean Michael Levin's lab. I'll talk more about him later and all research papers are linked in the description below. Okay, so before moving on to the frogs, there are two more things about the worms. The first is that if you cut the worm in half and then take the tail and regenerate a new head, it will still have memories from the original head, such as where home is. And the second thing is that you can change the electrical potential at the wound so that when it regrows, it grows back the heads of different species of these worms. The head eventually goes back to the shape of the original species after around 30 days, but this means we just grew a different species of worm without using genetic engineering and only by bioelectricity. Okay, so now for frogs. Frogs can't regenerate limbs, unlike their amphibious counterparts, the axolotl. They lose this ability when they undergo metamorphosis from a tadpole to a frog. And this is what some of their attempts at regeneration look like after amputation. You can see this one grows a little, but it's mostly scar tissue and not a usable limb. But if you amputate this limb and then attach a bioreactor containing progesterone, which is a potent neurosteroid that promotes nerve repair, then the limb starts to regenerate. And this is what the regeneration of the frog's limb looks like over nine and a half months. In this case, the frog regenerated everything up to the webbing on the limb and it regained full mobility in the limb. And to me, the coolest aspect of this is that the bioreactor was only applied for 24 hours and it stimulated the entire nine and a half months of growth. Now this is because the progesterone causes an upregulation and downregulation of certain cell processes. And one of the most important ones, you guessed it, is related to the resting potential of the cell membrane. And this change in the resting potential is what stimulates a pro-regenerative bioelectric profile. These processes essentially tell the frog to go through the same process as it did while growing from a tadpole to a frog, so now it regenerates the limb instead of scarring over. And we can easily observe these changes in the cartilage core compared to the control limb by seeing increased vascularization and energy supply. You also see cross limb communication between the cut and the uncut leg, but this isn't fully understood yet. Okay, so now that we've discussed planarian worms and the frogs, what's next? 
And of course, next after this frog is mammalian application. So we're trying to we're trying to work up to human medicine at some point. Well, I'll come right back to this. But now that we know how to manipulate these bioelectric fields to create these two-headed worms and also generate these processes that lead to limb regrowth, how can we play with this? Well, let's take this frog and turn it back into a tadpole. And see how everything just seems to slide into the correct place? Well, let's adjust that while it's growing. Well, it turns out that if you adjust the eyes up or down, left or right, they will eventually slide back into the correct place. It corrects the position when it detects altered bioelectricity, and the best way to describe it is like it's looking for the lowest point on this gradient. And the lowest point would be considered the resting potential. So if it detects that the eye is at the top of the gradient with altered bioelectricity, it moves it to the bottom to find the resting potential. This is actually similar to the worms in that the head is at the bottom of a certain gradient and then the tail is at the bottom of another gradient. Okay, and as if we haven't done enough damage to this tadpole yet, let's take away its eyes and attach one of them to its tail. Well, what did you expect? It's still blind. But since it probably has a headache now, let's give it some migraine medicine. Awesome, this activated the 5-HT1B pathway. We do this because it has been previously shown to induce nerve growth by modulating the host resting potential, or in other words, altering the bioelectricity. And now that we've activated this pathway in the grafted eye of the tadpole, we see nerve growth. Over time, you can see this grow and attach to the rest of the nervous system, and now our blind tadpole can see out of its grafted eye. And just for fun, we can also do this to frogs on their butt and on their back. And now for one more experiment on these poor little tadpoles. If you take nicotine and expose it to a developing tadpole, you'll cause brain defects. You can see this because the brain on the right is not nearly as developed as the one on the left. But if you take two FDA-approved molecular activators of HCN channels, which are just voltage-gated channels in these tadpoles, this restores the correct neural membrane voltage patterns despite the presence of nicotine. And you can see this because now the brains on the right and the left look the same and we've restored their brain function. And one more thing before getting into the future of bioelectricity is that we can cut the tail off of this salamander, then graft the tail to where a limb used to be, and then over time, it will form into a limb. And that's because at this location, the salamander's body knows that the lowest resting potential is in the shape of a limb and not the tails. And so it reshapes itself over time. Being able to understand where they're located and what a standard salamander is supposed to look like is something that these, uh, that these cells are able to do. All right, so now we're getting into the fun stuff, but it's also the speculative stuff. So if you disagree, write your stuff in the comments, but this is what I think the future will look like. And of course, next after this frog is mammalian application. So we're trying to, we're trying to work up to human medicine at some point. So first off, what's the base status of human regeneration? Quick warning for slightly graphic images, but it's been known since the 70s that if a child's finger is amputated, it can grow back within around 24 days. And this is without any type of treatment other than wrapping it. Also, this only applies to fingers and not toes or full limb amputations, and it's only for young children. And while adults don't have the ability to regenerate without any intervention, they do have the ability to regenerate with some intervention. As seen in this study, you do have the ability to regenerate with some skin grafts. But neither of these are full limb regeneration. And while Michael Levin's lab hasn't posted the full paper on mice limb regeneration, generation yet, this is what the mice biodome looks like. And since we were able to use the frog biodome to stimulate the regeneration pathways which are similar to the development processes, it makes sense that we'd be able to do this for a mice and eventually humans. And the reason everyone is so confident about this is because just like the frog, we already have these growth pathways in our genetics, it's just a matter of stimulating them after amputation, so that instead of going through the scarring process, it goes through the growth process. In fact, Michael Levin is so confident that he says the worst case scenario is that if you get your arm blown off at 25, by 30 35, you will have a teenager's hand. This is insanely cool. He's saying that Deadpool regeneration abilities are the future. And all we would need to do is apply a biodome reactor immediately after amputation, at least initially. And because our bodies already know how to grow these limbs, we've done it before, it won't overgrow like this. And so this is the future of limb regeneration. <laughs> So, what about instead of when we lose limbs, what happens when cell processes go wrong, like cancer? I'll let Michael Levin explain this one. So one way to think about cancer is as cells that have basically, for whatever reason, stopped obeying the normal patterning cues of the body. They've, they've reverted to an almost unicellular uh, um, uh, identity where they treat the rest of the organism as, uh, as, as the environment, then they do whatever they want. And so it turns out that processes of regeneration and development can 
reprogram or tame cancer cells. So old work in the salamander by uh, cutting off salamander legs that have a tumor on them, or in fact putting uh, aggressive human uh, cancer cells into embryos show that the surrounding environment can provide patterning cues that will cause these cancer cells to behave normally and to become part of normal tissues. And so this potentially has real implications for cancer therapy because uh, killing these cells with, uh, with, uh, with toxins, basically, chemotherapy may not be the only, the only way to go if we understood how, the, how these other systems were uh, reprogramming them. Now, to take it to its furthest point, if we've solved limb regeneration and we've solved cancer therapy and we've solved brain defects and Michael Levin is working on the biostasis project, which is looking for a way to slow down biological time, how soon until we solve aging? All right, so now that we've solved it... Okay, so now that we've solved immortality, let's look at the future of synthetic organisms. Okay, before we move on, I want to say that plant cells are similar to animal cells in that they both have bioelectricity. This is what keeps them alive, but that's outside of the scope of this video. If you want to see a video on that in the future, definitely let me know in the comments below. Since we've proven that we can create two-headed and three-headed and four-headed worms just by manipulating bioelectricity, what happens when we start with a frog embryo? This is the premise of the Xenobot research. The Xenobot was computationally designed and then built from heart muscle and skin cells from the frog embryo. And while they moved on their own, they also demonstrated collective behavior and they were able to manipulate objects and transport objects to new locations. One future use of the collective behavior could be collecting ocean plastic. Maybe you could embed the enzyme for degrading ocean plastic in the xenobot and then it goes around the ocean degrading plastic. And the object transportation is interesting because you can imagine putting drugs in the pouch and then transporting them into a patient. So to take it a step further, you can imagine taking the migraine medicine which was used to stimulate nerve growth for the grafted eye and use the xenobot to deliver it to multiple locations where grafted eyes are on the tadpole and use it to stimulate multiple eyes. Or what if we took a similar drug that stimulates nerve growth in a human and grafted multiple eyes onto that human? Would we just grow multiple eyes? Trust me, I know it seems far-fetched, but I'm just extrapolating given prior research. Regardless, the idea of just drug delivery using xenobots is cool in general. Or maybe instead of using xenobots to deliver drugs, we can control their collective behavior using Sheepdog, which I'll let my previous TikTok explain what this is. So this is an electric bioreactor. It has an anode and cathode and it can support life here, and then it generates this electrical field. And by just changing the direction of the electric field, you can change the direction of the cell movements. Here it is moving the cells in circles, which is pretty awesome. So maybe we can take this somewhat disorganized collective behavior and specifically direct it using Sheepdog. I'm not sure exactly how this would be used, but I'm confident that there are interesting ideas using this. And since the Xenobot was sculpted from frog embryos, we shouldn't be limited to just one type of Xenobot. There should be a biological CAD design software that lets us design and print these organisms in any way we want. And if all we need to do is express already existing growth sequences, What's the limit to what we can design? Well, Michael Levin already asked that if we can regenerate limbs in existing areas, can we create limbs in new areas? And the answer is yes. The main idea is that you need to manipulate the bioelectric field so that it thinks that there should be a limb in this area, and boom you have a six-legged frog. It's about the same complexity as creating a two-headed or three-headed or four-headed worm, except it just looks way cooler. And you can even take these same principles and grow an arm on top of an arm. So then why should humans be limited to two arms? What if we can grow an extra pair of arms? Or if we can grow our own replacement organs? Theoretically, all we'd need to do is express the correct bioelectrical gradients in that location. And then a cascade of cell processes would do the rest. The only limit is that we're not doing any genetic engineering, so we're limited by what the human DNA can express. So while we could manipulate the bioelectricity to grow new arms, we wouldn't be able to grow new wings because that's not in our DNA. Unless, of course, we use genetic engineering to add it to our DNA. It'd be pretty funny if in the future I do a video on the future of humanity with wings. Now, all of these ideas are awesome, in my opinion, but we obviously don't know everything. And even if bioelectricity seems to be one of the most important things happening in an organism, it's not the only thing. But even so, in my opinion, I believe it's dramatically under-researched compared to fields like genetics. And this is mostly because of history after DNA was discovered and the human genome was 
sequenced. And after the realization that different organisms were just different strings of base pairs that could potentially be edited, you can see how it makes sense that everyone was saying that the genes were just the software or the code of the organism. But that's not how Michael Levin sees it. His insight was seeing the gene as the hardware that builds the organism, such as a planarian worm or a frog, similar to an iPhone or a Pixel. And that by manipulating the bioelectricity, you're installing a software update that gives you two heads or an extra eye or six legs without changing the hardware. The reason we focus on bioelectricity is because uh, electricity is uh, remarkably well suited for things like uh, memory and decision making. Specifically, what I mean is uh, a voltage gated channel or a voltage gated gap junction is a voltage gated current conductor. This is, this is in effect a transistor. It means that using, using circuits made of those things, you can easily build up to um, almost any kind of computational process that you want. And lastly, he became interested in this field by reading a book called The Body Electric. In 1986, I was at the World's Fair in uh, Vancouver, Canada. And I was in a, uh, in a used bookshop and I found this book by Robert Becker called The Body Electric. And what was remarkable about that book was that you know, among other things, uh, it goes back and it cites all these papers going back, you know, from before 1900 to people who actually thought about electrical signaling outside of the nervous system during embryogenesis and fungi and plants and all these different things. If I had to pick one moment, I would say that would be that would be the time where it really gelled for me that that this does make sense that evolution really did discover um, how good the biophysics of electricity is for computing and for and processing it. Cool. And that is the future of bioelectricity. I hope this video inspires some people to start researching this. All papers are linked in the description below. I'm confident that there are still ideas that need to be explored in this space, obviously. So if you're working on researching in this space, you're building a startup in this space, or if you're investing in this space, definitely reach out to me and maybe we can make some electricity happen. Yes, I waited until the end of the video to make this joke. <laughs> okay, see you guys in the next one. is purely about triggering the kinds of uh, cascades, the kinds of uh, uh, patterning subroutines that these animals already have embedded in their electrical software. And of course, next after this frog is mammalian application. So we're trying to, we're trying to work up to human medicine at some point. Okay. So one of the...